Hello and welcome to this episode of Human Rights Magazine. My name is Derek McCush. In this episode, we take a somewhat different approach to our focus on human rights and look not at a social situation, but rather look at technological possibilities. Artificial intelligence is rapidly emerging as a new tool as computer technology accelerates in the ability of machines to learn and emulate human thinking. Listen to this episode as Charlotte Powers explores the impact that AI may have on human rights, especially in humanitarian work. How can artificial intelligence be leveraged to protect human rights? AI's life-saving capabilities have already been embraced by the humanitarian sector. Different AI tools are being used in both conflict and disaster zones to save time and lives. However, the consequences of deploying flawed AI technology in the field are severe. This podcast will explore the ways AI can uplift human rights, as well as the risks and dangers of AI misuse. Joining me today are three experts who work in this field, Professor Rachel Kittle Monroe, Jennifer Addison, and Dr. Rowena Rodriguez. To get a better understanding of AI's potential in the humanitarian field, I spoke with Rachel Kittle Monroe, who worked with MSF during the Rwandan genocide. I'm trained as a lawyer. Um, I started working on human rights issues, especially linked to climate and indigenous peoples. And then after that, I went more into the, the humanitarian work with Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières. And that really was a sort of a different angle of human rights for me. It was really then much more linked to those humanitarian crises. I've spent a lot of time in the field. And so I really saw how human rights fed through that, and especially in my work in Rwanda, where you're working in a genocide. You really see that interface between humanitarianism and human rights in a very, very, um, very tight way. Could you tell me about your time with Médecins Sans Frontières? I had to do one report a month and that was sent by fax. And if they got it, they got it. And if the fax didn't work, they didn't get it, it didn't matter. So it's a completely different world. This was the pre-digital world and it had a lot of sort of great characteristics about it, but it was also had a lot of massive faults about it. And those massive faults, were we didn't know what was going on. Hmm, I see. So given how much positive potential AI holds, do you think humanitarian actors have a duty to embrace new technology? You mentioned that one of the main struggles you dealt with in the field was due to the lack of technology and inaccessible information. The AI, I think the things that it can do positively, it can it can um, analyze information for us. It can bring together essential information. We can get all of that, which saves us weeks and months of research in, to do. So that is great. It gives us a starting point. Um, but that in itself is not going to change anything. It's then what we do with that information. Can you give me an example of a specific kind of technology that humanitarian actors are currently using that's making a positive difference? AI can be really positive in is things like scientific or, and medical developments. Now, MSF using AI has now developed an antibiotic test for multi-drug resistant. It's amazing. And is 90% effective. I'm sure you've seen it, but it's, it's just extraordinary. Whoa, I can see how that can be life-changing, especially in remote regions. I mean, whether it be in emergency responses, medical diagnostics, or even search and rescue, we can't deny that AI holds insane life-saving potential. So to get a better understanding of what is necessary to develop AI tools that can support human rights, I spoke with Jennifer Addison. She's a project manager at Montreal's AI for Good Lab, whose mission is to mentor women and gender diverse individuals as they diversify the tech space. I've always wanted to work at organizations that, um, from my perspective, are, are aiming to contribute something um, or have positive impact on society, no matter how small uh, their particular target audience is, whether it's impacting a handful of people or maybe an entire community or city, etc., my actual background um, is in global studies with a concentration in Middle Eastern studies. I found my way to the AI for Good Lab through an organization called Queer Tech, and they're working to queer the tech ecosystem, which um, is also super important to me as a queer person. 
So an AI for Good Lab for it's a seven week program. And for the last three weeks, the trainees are split into groups to work on an AI project um, that addresses a social issue or just for social good. Um, there are regional coordinators. So the lab is delivered in partnership with CIFAR and Vector, um, the Design Fabrication Zone at Toronto Metropolitan University and Amy. So my role is from the smallest details to the largest details, making sure that this program runs. That's super cool. So when it comes to tech development, I would love to understand why we first need to focus on the human being behind the code. When we're talking about tech or AI, let's not forget that there is a human behind these things that we are developing or a team of, of, of people. To think that our own biases um, or thoughts in terms of we are constantly being fed information um, that is also rooted in bias and stereotypes and tropes, um, et cetera, to think that that's not then being coded into whatever we are working on or or that that's not touching the development of whatever project we're working on would be, we'd be mistaken to think that. So based on what you're saying, diversifying the tech space can be a tool to strengthen the technological product itself. What other approaches are being implemented to combat algorithmic bias? DEI is important because it, it can present an opportunity to try to correct some of the inequities that persist today. Um, certainly those cannot be corrected without an actual reckoning or acknowledgement of why those inequities exist um, or why the systems were built and designed um, intentionally to be inequitable or to be exclusionary. Um, I think it's important to understand what kinds of questions um, and interrogations we can do at every step of a project in order to try to catch our own biases, at what point to bring in certain types of stakeholders, um, how have you engaged the folks who um, will be impacted by whatever you're developing. When I think about the AI for Good Lab, for example, um, I'm constantly reminded of why this space exists on a very basic level, let's say. So this program is for women and gender diverse um, individuals. And um, I was talking to one of our trainees um, recently, and she said to me, you know, I am the only girl in my, let's say one of her computer science classes, and I find it so difficult. Um, I don't feel comfortable asking questions. I'm so afraid to look stupid. There is this feeling of, okay, maybe I'm the only one in the space or the only one that has made it in this space. And now I am carrying the weight of, of responsibility representing everyone that looks like me or is like me. And that one is, is an awful feeling. Because of human bias, AI cannot truly be neutral. The consequences of excessive bias can be very serious when it comes to human right abuses. To understand more about AI's negative effects on individuals, I spoke with Dr. Rowena Rodriguez, who has a legal, ethical, and technological background. Dr. Rodriguez is currently the co-lead of Innovation and Research Services at Trilateral Research, a UK-based organization providing ethical AI solutions to companies. So I think the ability that AI has to like identify, classify, and discriminate, I think that's what magnifies the potential for human rights abuses. Right. So why does this happen, even if technology is designed to help individuals? AI systems, they kind of, uh, they have this ability to replicate the patterns and data that they are trained on. So it's only an AI system is only good as the data I trained on. And I think if, if there are gaps in this, if this was not done well, and if it is focused, say, for example, on some parts of the population and not on others, then it can have disproportionate or the wrong impacts on the wrong groups. You know, use of AI in healthcare can be beneficial, which was which is also a very good thing. It can also then, because the AI system, say, for example, was trained on a certain cohort of the population and then was taken and implemented on another, then it could result not just in the wrong types of treatments and this affects the right to life and the right to, you know, it's, it goes to the core of it might be the difference between life and death sometimes. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. 
Could you explain how AI also has the ability to enhance the vulnerability of individuals? What role does technology play in protecting human rights? The other key issue, I think, is the robustness, security, and safety one. I think if we get this wrong, nothing else matters, right? I think AI systems must function in a robust, secure, and safe way because of the potential of the impact that they can have on human populations. And, you know, they can, if they're not robust, if they're not secure, and if they're not safe, they make us more vulnerable. And that's not the intention of an AI system. That makes sense. Professor Kittle Monroe, what would the consequences of a data breach or a privacy violation look like on the ground? The big problem with all of this is that it's great to have this information. It's great, to, but it's all about how is it used by the human beings at the end? And this is where I think the fear comes in. Um, the fear is if you start to have that kind of information and you'll be able to monitor people's movement, let's just take that one. You can monitor movements of refugees and migrants and you can, that's great. You say, okay, well, that's for humanitarian use. It's pure intention. It's ethical. But if that information gets into the warring factions' hands, it becomes extremely dangerous. So it's going to be about these checks and balances and boundaries around it. So even if AI is originally being deployed to support individuals, it may lead to more harm than good if systems aren't robust or if data isn't being properly protected. Because AI is developing so quickly, I know there is a lot of fear surrounding this topic at the moment. So while it's important to talk about these risks, I also wanted to learn more about how AI is upholding communities across the globe. Dr. Rodriguez, how can AI positively impact human rights? So in in the simplest form, AI solutions that help prevent poverty and disease and are implemented in the medical sector, you could say, hang on a minute, that's positive for the right to health care. Yes, so it is having a positive impact on healthcare, on the right to life. Uh, AI in education can affect your right to education, you know, but translation tools, making education better for everyone. That's fantastic. Professor Kittle Monroe spoke to me about her current work at the humanitarian organization she runs called Sea Change Initiative. She's calling for community-first approaches to address the shortcomings of relying solely on technology to address the needs of vulnerable communities. Today, I'm executive director of an organization that I started in 2018 called Sea Change Initiative, um, which is working to develop, uh, to reimagine humanitarian action and see how we can put communities at the heart of humanitarian health crisis response. Ideally, if I could, I would apply a community first approach to it. For instance, we're all talking a lot about traditional knowledge, ways of doing, ways of being, which are not digitalized, which are not based in the Western framework and concepts. How do we value those as much as we would value the information that comes from a non-human intelligence? And how would we create something which is able to ensure that that human intelligence remains central and the non-human intelligence becomes something that supports and uplifts and helps the human intelligence to advance and develop? Sounds a bit esoteric, but if I put it in a very practical way around a health crisis, to say TB in the north, um, community Pond Inlet has a huge TB outbreak right now. There's a lot that... AI can do to understand how TB is in the community. But how about we put, first of all, the the indigenous knowledge, the community's knowledge of TB and its impact, the knowledge of how their community functions, where the elders are, where the youth are, and they do that kind of human mapping of the whole thing. And that is all in their heads, right? Jennifer Addison reinforced this approach as well. In her work, she advocates for constant reflection and collaboration between parties. She believes that different perspectives can strengthen communities and improve AI's successful implementation on the ground. Let's say if we're talking about um, communities that have been the most marginalized or maybe are the most vulnerable, let's acknowledge that there 
are existing trust issues um, and that AI is no different. And if I have had trust issues um, that are completely valid with various institutions, why would anything be different if suddenly I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to just say, oh, AI is just going to change everything and it's going to be great for you and we have solutions to all of your problems. Why would I suddenly say, oh, okay, yes, this is going to be different this time. And this is what I mean going back to understanding the historical context of the groups that you're working with. Um, and so building trust takes time. While AI's potential is undeniable, all of my interviewees agree that we need more accountability mechanisms. According to them, securitization, constant adaptation, and ethics are essential to ensure human rights be kept central. Dr. Rodriguez emphasized the need for more AI guidelines to be developed. It's it's quite tricky. I think with regard to human rights, what we did find was that you can only enjoy your human rights as long as they are safeguarded and there are effective mechanisms to report and address concerns. So there was a little bit of a gap in terms of uh, the national human rights institutions being fully equipped to monitor activities with regard to, you know, AI. But I think now there's more guidance being developed. So I think any organizations that either use or deploy AI, I think, should be accountable for the system's proper functioning. Um, and by proper functioning, it doesn't mean, uh, you know, just the technical functioning. I think it's also for the respect of, you know, respecting the other principles, respecting whether the ethical requirements or what is it the system needs to do in terms of any roles, context. Uh, I think the system should also be consistent with the state of the art. The state of the art moves on quite a lot. I think that it's not just about compliance, but it's also about Ethics says, you know, ethics gives us that lens of looking at something from more than a compliance point of view to thinking about what are the consequences and to thinking about it constantly. So you don't stop. So I think ethics is that continued, renewed ability to look at it. Sometimes you might just do a human rights impact assessment, for example, or you might do an integrated one that looks at ethical issues human rights issues, data protection issues, and all of that stuff. So there's many different ways to tailor it because the way technologies develop and evolve, I think you need to keep refreshing your lens. Um, societal needs change as well. Professor Kittle Munro also agreed with the need for more ethical guidelines in the creation of AI. I think, I think that we need to have an ethical framework for AI, I think that's in, in humanitarian action. I can't deal with the whole world, but in humanitarian action, it needs an ethical framework where everything goes through, just like we do research, and we have to have research boards and approvals and all of this. We need to do the same thing for the use of AI. No idea how to do it, but this is the only way that we can keep that humanness in it. Because ethics, a computer cannot analyze ethics. It can tell you what the ethics are, but it can't tell you what you should do. Or we explain, you know, only human beings can do that. So we need to really go down is what does it mean to be human? We also discussed the last piece of the puzzle, regulation, and the role it plays in safeguarding rights. Regulation is definitely not simple. As we know, the law is not always able to catch up with innovation. So because of existing challenges, Dr. Rodriguez argues that all actors at play will have to be creative and collaborate to come up with solutions that protect everyone and allow technology development to prosper. I think with AI, what we need to ad what we need to address its challenges. It's not a like it's it's not a that there is no silver bullet bullet here. I think what we need is something that is dynamic because of the nature of the technology. We're, we're still changing all the time, right? Things are evolving, new solutions are coming up and some people, are, sometimes it's also stagnating. So some things are just not working out. Um, so the problem with the law is the law is a slower paced creature. So that's always going to be a challenge. So we've got the developments like the EU AI Act that are coming about. They're adopting a risk-based, this is why they're adopting a risk-based approach. And I think, you know, that thing about um, should we, it's not a should we regulate, it's it's a, we need to regulate for more responsible AI, right? So I think 
we want to build responsible ai to address complex problems and i think we also understand that we need to mitigate the risks and challenges of unregulated use so that's where we are coming at it from because it's not a one versus the other approach it does not work um it's a thing of whether it's the industry whether it's the regulators i think they need to work together because if you if you ask industry they'll say the regulators don't get us because they don't understand the technology but you can only get that relationship when you talk to one another so i think i love the fact that now we have those fora where people sit down there's more technical engagement with the legal sector and there's more legal engagement with the technical sector so the, yeah i don't like looking at it in terms of it's us versus them it's not the law versus innovation or it's not um, regulation versus i think it's regulation with innovation that's the way i would see it yeah. thank you for listening to this episode of human rights magazine the podcast is brought to you by the upstream journal i invite you to consider supporting the program and the magazine with a contribution through paypal as you explore other episodes 